Hello and welcome back to the podcast. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simu, and on this edition of When Harry Met, the series where we talk to ex-pros and some of the game's most high-profile broadcast journalists, my guest this week is none other than former Wolverhampton Wanderers goalkeeper Matt Murray. Now, you will definitely recognise Matt from his fantastic career and, of course, uh, from Sky Sports if you are uh, a viewer based here in the UK. Matt is a fantastic pundit an absolute gentleman and he took some time out of his very very busy schedule to talk to us so kick back relax and enjoy matt thank you so much for joining me mate it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show first of all how are you i'm good i'm good always busy trying to you know get that work-life balance and still get in the gym a little bit but look I'm, i'm all good thank you very much and thank you for having me on Good, glad to hear it and it's our pleasure It is our pleasure indeed Now Matt, um, I want to talk to you about how your career begun Where did it all begin? Did you always want to be a goalkeeper? And how did it sort of come about? I think like most goalkeepers I'm a frustrated striker <laughs> um, I, I, I used to The reason I ended up in goal um, It's a bit complicated with all my background But I, I'm adopted from birth um, And I've got a brother who's adopted as well So he's not my biological brother But he's older than me but he's actually a lot smaller than me. So I'm six foot five and bald. He's five foot six with dreadlocks. So we look like Danny and Arnie. We used to rock her out together. And basically, because he was older than me, uh, you know, it is as a little bro, you want to play and join him with your brother's mates. So the only way I was allowed to play was if I went in goal because nobody else wanted to go in goal. So I went in goal, did all that. With my own age group, I'd play outfield, love it, score goals. I wasn't technically great, but I was big and strong and quick. Um, and then yeah, just play, playing with my for my brother's mate, uh, mates teams and all that. Scouts said to me, "Oh, we, we really like what we're seeing. Would you like to come to a trial?" And the guy who coached as well was with was involved with Wolves and an apprentice. And then when they realised I was actually playing a year above myself, they were even happier. And then it just went from there. So at the age of nine, I joined Wolves, worked all the way through schoolboys, apprentice, pro contract at seventeen, and. Yeah, played in the first team there. So, yeah, so joined at nine, retired at the age of 29 through injury. So, yeah, my whole time was at, at Wall, so 20 years there. That's very rare nowadays, isn't it, to find a player who spent his entire career at one club. You, you don't really tend to see that so much anymore. Did you grow up supporting Wolves, or is it a team that you fell in love with during the course of your career there? I think that my stepdad is from uh, Wallasey. And he, he loved his football and he was an Everton fan. So Neville Southall was my hero. Um, when Shaq Islop and David James came into the game, because being a, uh, a mixed race goalkeeper myself, I looked at those guys and related to them uh, with their, you know, with their, their physiques and everything else. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, being a young black guy, you look at them and there weren't many black goalkeepers there. But because I joined Wolves at the age of nine, I used to get free tickets and go and watch the games. And my Sunday league manager, Don Astle, I still speak to this day, he was a Wolves fan, so he used to take me along with him and his son and watch the game. So I love Mike Stowell and people like that. So once you're in the club for so long, you really start to understand the history. So I always look out for the Everton result because once you have a team, it's your team in it. You can't Absolutely. change that. But Wolves, because of my my affiliation with them, you know, they're, they're them. I, you know, I am a Wolves fan. I can't because I've just been, it's part of me. You know what I mean? It's part of me. I love the fans. I love the club. And it's great to see where they're at. So, yeah, Everton fan, if you like, because of that, my stepdad. But, you know, just Wolves has to be my club. Yeah, Wolves will always be deep in your heart, of course, when you when you spend so long at a club. I mean, it's only natural. And, you know, we'll come on to talk about Wolves currently in a, in a few moments' time because they're doing really well, in my opinion. They've, they've taken things up a notch under uh, Nuno, which is great to see from a Wolves perspective. But you mentioned there, Matt, that your career ended a little bit prematurely because of injuries how frustrating was that at the time because I can imagine you know mentally when you work so hard to get somewhere and you got to the top where you you wanted to be to have to struggle with injuries must have been a real blow was it not yeah the mental side is probably the and you know is one of the biggest things in it and I was lucky to have amazing people around me you know family my children, you know, friends, the club, the fans. Um, but it's really, really tough and you have to work on it. And there's a lot more awareness now with the, the mental side of things. But you have to accept life isn't fair. 
because you work really, really hard and you think, oh, what might have been? And you look at it and, you know, I was with a good friend of mine, Carl Ikeemi, the other day. And again, you look at him and he had to finish through illness. For me, it's through injury at 29. But you, you can sometimes look at what you didn't have and what you might have had. And that was a tough bit because it's what you love doing. It's what you dreamed of doing. And even before you got paid to do it, you did it and you gave your all and you put your body on the line. So when you're getting paid to do something that most people could only dream of, when you're fit and playing, it is the best job in the world. I don't care about the pressures of letting a bad goal in or this and that. You know, that to get paid to be in work for half nine, ten o'clock, massage, gym, food, all your kit done, beautiful pitch, nets on your goal, as many <laughs> balls as you want. You don't have to run and fetch the ball back. You know, you win with your teammates, good food, you travel the world, you've got that routine, that structure. Everything's there that's just what you love, that identity. So, yeah, the injury side's really, really tough. It is. It's horrible. I still pay for it now with the with the aches and pains. Look, the old, that would be the only bit of my career that I would change is that I wish I could have stayed injury free and then you never know what could have happened because I could have controlled the rest. So, yeah, it felt like life wasn't fair, but to still have played 100 games for the club that I loved, uh, to play in the playoff final the first time back to, you know, to the Premier League, to be part of that squad, to play the likes of Jolien Lescott, Robbie Keane, Lee Naylor, lads have grown up with, Paul Ince, Dennis Irwin, top players you grew up watching, you know, played against some of the best players. You know, I have played against Paul Gascoigne, Stephen Gerrard, Gareth Bale, people like that. So, yes, it's been really, really tough, but to have ran out in front of those fans at Molyneux, I did live what my dream was. But, yeah, I also have that bit of... Do you know what? I wasn't ready to retire. It felt cruel. But end of the day, I've still still had a bit of a career and I'm very, very fortunate to still be in the game. Absolutely. And, and you know what? It's refreshing to hear somebody speak in such a positive manner like that because it is easy to be, uh, you know, upset, bitter about it. But, you know, it, it's good that you acknowledge that the great things you've done and that, and that you're able to cope with it. And, you know, like you said, there is more awareness around that and there's probably more support for players nowadays um, but it's great to hear that you know you're in good spirits and you have made a fantastic career out of your punditry and, and various other bits and pieces, which is great to see. Thank you. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I uh, you, you've got to keep evolving. Do you know what I mean? And that's why, like now, I love you know the media side is very very good. It's fun. Uh, again, you know people go, oh, you're at Sunderland and you're at Middlesbrough and you're down in Swansea and this and that. I said, yeah, but those fans work all day, pay their petrol, pay a ticket. Sometimes their team get absolutely spanked and then they have to drive back. I get paid to watch football now. So getting paid to play football for me is, is not work, is it? Come on, man. It's, it's, it's amazing. You, you of course, pre-season's tough and this and that, but I still love to smash the gym now, so that's not a problem. Then I get paid to go and watch it, so I love it. I've been fortunate enough to coach, and I love that. Again, when you work on something with a player, and then for them to execute it on a match day and, or get a contract and the family and the player are so, so happy. It feels brilliant, you know. So, And now I've moved into the agency side of things. And again, growing with young players and, uh, you know, being working for them and being part of the team again is fantastic. So I'm very fortunate to still be in the game. I work very, very hard. The hours you work as a, pl- as a player, um, you know, the, of course you have to, you know, rest and, the, and eating right is part of your job. But the hours you put in afterwards, you know, being an agent, being a coach, then you realise how blessed you were as a player. But I think just to be involved in football, it's very, very competitive. There's some great sides of it. You see the good and the bad of it, for example, with the England game, the racism. I've experienced that. It's tough. But I just think we can keep using the game to make a difference, break down barriers, you know, the amount of female pundits I'm on with now, you know, the rainbow laces, everything about football. I just love seeing the good of it and what it can do. So, yeah, blessed to be in the game, loving the media side, loving every bit of it, but you still have that bit of you going, oh, just one more game. If I could run out at <laughs> Molyneux for one more game against the Albion or something like that, I, I would I would pay to do that. It is just, it's the best buzz, the best buzz. I can only imagine, my friend. I can only imagine. Um, Matt, one of the questions that we always ask uh, our ex-pros on the show, or two questions that we always ask, is the best player you've ever played with and the best player you've ever played against. Often I'm surprised by the answers I get to this. So I'm 
curious to hear <laughs> who you would see. Okay, look, I was f- fortunate again. Towards the, I was starting out, and towards the end of, of his career, I played the likes of Steve Ball. Robbie Keane was in my youth team. We played together in pre-season and stuff, and then he went on to get the moves he did. Dennis Irwin, Paul Linzer, say England and the 21s were some fantastic players, you know. Um, but the one that I say I played the most games with influenced every game was just unbelievable and what I loved about him as well he was so respected in the dressing room still one of my best friends now he he's always got time for you you know that little saying some people speak to you in their spare time and some people spare time to speak to you yeah and he always makes that time for you if you need him he's there and you knew he was the best pro he could be had horrible knee injuries at a young age still went on and played Won the Premier League twice, won the FA Cup, played for England, Manchester City, you know, even played for those like down the road. But every dressing room (laughs) he was in, he was ultimately respected. Played all different opponents. So can you guess he's a centre half I'm talking about here? Ex Wolves, Everton, Man City, West Brom, Aston Villa. Jolian. (laughs) Jolian Lescott is the best pro, the best player. I played with and got nothing but love for him. So yeah, best player I played with for those reasons is uh, Jolly Lescott. Bet you never Fantastic. had it such long winded, have you? As that? <laughs> no, that, it was good because you had me. I was sitting there and I was trying to think. I was like, bloody hell, if he asks me who it is now and I don't know this, <laughs> I'm having a shocker. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, man, I got it in the end. <laughs> yeah. And then I said, I was played, you know, I played against some very, very good players as well. A couple I should have played against and I didn't, so I was sub against Arsenal because I was through injury and that was the Invincibles and that. And then uh, I remember being on the bench when Bergkamp was playing and the one that really upset me, I passed my fitness test for England under 21s. We should have played against Portugal. And then he played Stephen Bywater, David Platt did, and I didn't play against Ronaldo. And they beat us four and I was raging. And again, I was on the bench against Man United, so I never got to play against Ronaldo, so I was screwing with that. Um... But I would say, even though he's towards the end of his career, just because of the records he's got, the way he played, the way he had to reinvent himself because of the injury, he had a lot of injuries as a player, all-time leading Premier League goal scorer, has to be the best player I played against was uh, Alan Shearer. Fantastic. Uh, I mean, Alan Shearer was an incredible striker. And you mentioned some of the others there, you know, the the Dennis Bergkamps and the, the Cristiano Ronaldos. I mean unbelievable to think that when you're a young kid you know playing football in the park with your friends that you'd be coming across these kind of players so I mean like we were saying earlier you know incredible that you, you've been able to have these opportunities and you know even being contention to play against these players is, is unreal yeah I was blessed and I remember the first under 21 squad that Wayne Rooney came into he came into a training camp and he was with us and he just thought whoa who's this young boy 16 you hear all about him but just as soon as the way he trained and the attitude and he never played he didn't even play a game he just went straight to the seniors he was that good um, so I played against him in a in a like an in-house game and just remember like a, he, he was awesome so he played against Paul Gascoigne Paul Gascoigne came to Wolves as well at the end of his career and was training with us and obviously was nowhere near the play he was that he grew up watching but to have Dennis Irwin and Paul Lintz in your old dressing room and play with them that was that was special because they were great great players great people very different characters but top top players so say in the under 21s we had Jermaine Defoe from Michael Carrick in midfield like I said Gareth Barry Joe Cole I mean we should have experienced you know we should have gone on and won so much more than we did but well we didn't win anything and that was a frustrating side of it some real tough players but uh, yeah look I've been fortunate on that side of things but I just you can't I always feel that I've got that bit of what might have been but I couldn't stay fit and I have to look at what I did get and the great people I've met and to be playing at Wolves man but yeah it's, it is tough injury is horrible and that's why you know when sometimes you get messages of fans or fans used to say stuff to you if they realise how much it hurt you and your family yeah. it doesn't matter what money people earn or the job sometimes people don't see that as a human being inside that kit does that make sense? yeah it's, that's, it's, that's, that's, it's that's very it. easy for fans to just you know just shout stupid things when they're angry and you know I'm an Arsenal supporter I see it at the Emirates all the time I see you know 
Some people, I look at them and they'll be in the stands next to me and some of the comments they come out with, I'm ashamed that I support the same club as them at times because yeah. they don't understand, A, the game, and they don't understand the human side of things. And I've been fortunate to be in a position where I get to talk to quite a few ex-pros and it's only when you talk to them that you understand how much dedication and hard work goes into becoming a footballer and it's not just a walk in the park. Yeah, it's a gym. And they found and a lot of the guys you've had, you know, volunteers and everything else and the, the ups and the downs and rushing back from training, the parents rushing back from work and affording football boots, goalie gloves as well when you gotta do both and everything else and the, the heartache and the rejection and the going again and all this and that. So it is tough and to make it as a professional football, that's why it's hard when you know, I blow my own trumpet, but when people say, oh, who's the worst player you played? Well, no one's bad. To become a professional footballer, you've yeah. got to be decent. Um, but then, you, you know, there are people that you look at and you think, oh, I wish you had a better attitude because you've got all the ability. When you see other people who maximise every bit they got, like Jody Craddock or played with Wolves, who just, he just knew he was the best he could be. He's had the best career he could possibly have had. And you look at people like that and all the different people from all walks of life, and it is great. And also what it can mean to fans, you know, when you see grown men cry, you know, you speak to, you know, you, after the playoff final, someone wrote me a letter that they'd named their son after me because I saved the penalty well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, amazing. my son was born... And things like that and you see some of your big name mates and the difference they can go and see people who are ill in hospital or whatever and it's 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 it's, it's an amazing game an amazing game so but it, yeah everyone's been on their own journey their own path to get there and uh, and that's sometimes what some fans don't see absolutely talking about wolves in the current day um of course under nuno they had an incredible season last year not only did they you know finish really in a really respectable position but they played some fantastic football. They were they were an absolute pleasure to watch. I went to Molyneux last season. I saw them absolutely batter Arsenal, which I can't say I enjoyed. I was but, there, <laughs> but you know it, it was it was clear how far this Wolves side had come. And I know they've had a bit of a dodgy start this season. I think the Europa League has probably played a part in that. But I mean, as somebody who supports Wolves, how pleased are you with the way things are going and the upward trajectory that the club seem to be on? Absolutely delighted. I mean, this is uh, the best team I've seen at Wolves. Okay, I've been, you know, I've just said to you, I've been involved with the club for nearly 30 years, seen promotion, seen time in the Premier League. This is the best. So the vision, the journey that the Fosun group are on, um, obviously Nuno is at the, he's captain of the ship. He's, for me, a tactical genius. I really, I don't know, people are like, oh, that's an overstatement, but he came into the championship didn't really know the division we went up we got promoted yeah he can spend this and that he, he played a system that he wasn't used to playing but he thought that was the best put Connor Cody in a, a centre of a back three uh, Ryan Bennett on a, you know from free from Norwich look what he did with him Matt Doherty's playing better than we've ever seen you know he made players better so what an unbelievable season you get the likes of Neves from the Champions League to the Championship fantastic right now we come to the Premier League People are saying, myself included, let's just stay up. You know, that would be a good season. We finished seventh. We got the semi-final of the FA Cup. We're seconds away from the final. We have a small squad that he keeps fit. Going to the likes of the Emirates, getting a draw, but on the counter-attack, we could have won the game. We win, a, you know, we drew away at Chelsea. We win away at Wembley. You know what I mean? Away at Wembley against Tottenham. I enjoyed you know, that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I bet you did. I bet you did. But, but you know what? The tactics are bang on. So he's got players believing and playing in the system. And then, so the journey's just been unbelievable. Now we're in Europe. Europe. You told me a few years ago when we were playing it, we're taking 10,000 fans to Milton Keynes in League One. They're going to be playing in Europe. You know, this is unbelievable. We keep the players. So Nuno's the key to that. I think the only bit we struggled with last season was breaking down teams where we had to dominate the ball. So Huddersfield did the double over us. We lost to Watford at home. Whereas teams like Arsenal and, and as you saw at Molyneux, when you bring it to us, we can just bam, counter-attack. We had the pace, the power, we're clinical. And that's what teams... So maybe we're getting a little bit more respect shown to us now because you know we can hurt you. Yeah. Um, but also it is hard and I just don't feel quite... Maybe the So every all the recruitment and the succession planning before Wolves have got better and better and better. I don't... Catrone is just finding his feet. Vallejo's come in. He's not better, in my opinion, than the defenders we've got. Mm -hmm. So 
that's what that's been a little bit of the side of it, but also battling on with all the travelling and everything else with the Europa League and you Arsenal fans know what the Europa League's like now. Oh. You didn't for many years, but you do now. But we for do Wolves, now. <laughs> yeah, but for Wolves, it's uh, it's an amazing achievement. We want to break the top four. We want to get Champions League football. Sorry, but for you guys, obviously, you want to get back in the Champions League. But for Wolves at the moment, the journey on it's fantastic. Um, some really, really good players. And then he's made the likes of Traore. He's improved him and he's at it now. And I thought the week we had beating Watford winning over in Turkey and then beating Manchester City. And and we deserve that win at Manchester City. Shows Absolutely. you how good Nuno is, how good he is tactically. Um, and, and, and it's exciting times. So, yeah, I think Wolves are on a great journey. Still a little bit to go. There is no complacency. But, uh, yeah, this, this is the best Wolves team. And I think he's a top, top manager. And we have to, have to keep it. Absolutely. And when you mentioned Traore there, and he's a player that's always had that raw pace, the power, the threat, but maybe not always had that maturity in goal scoring positions. And at Man City, he showed, you know, that he was as composed as anything, brilliant finishes. Um, and, and, you know, ultimately that made the difference. So, you know, I'm an Arsenal fan, but I love football and I love seeing teams, you know, Wolves traditionally are a big historic club and I enjoy seeing those kind of clubs that have kind of been sleeping giants for a while, sort of coming back to the forefront, and Nuno's certainly done that. Um, we mentioned a little bit earlier on racism in football, and it reared its ugly head again uh, last night in the England game. In your opinion, Matt, what is the... As a player who's experienced it, what do you think is the right action to take? I know UEFA have got this stupid three-point procedure you know you tell your captain your captain tells the officials etc etc but would you back players just getting up and walking off the pitch not just walking off so I think last night England have done it so when when we when we used to get racial abuse you just sort of rolled up your sleeve and you just got on with it okay so we were warned that it could happen but we just got on with it and we and nobody ever came to us and said oh how did you feel you know what I mean I remember Gary Neville on Monday Night Football talking about that and you think you know, no one ever said how we feel about it. We just got on with it. I remember it really hurt us, but our thing was, look, I had a black coach in Terry Connor, and it was just sort of like, right, we go harder. We, we You know, the way we'll answer them is we, we'll, we'll win. We'll win emphatically. So the England scoreline was emphatic. They got together. They followed the protocol. But what it's done is it's totally disgraced Bulgarian football. Everyone talked about it, and now it's been it's been shown. But what we need to see now is you only walk off if it's really is last resort, okay? But I think that what we need to see now is not a partial ban of 5,000 seats taken, because look what happened last night, okay? Yeah, and in exactly. a way, it's like some of those fans turned up and went, you've named and shamed us before, this and that, we'll show you. Well, actually, do you know what? Before, back in the day, you speak, I speak to my parents, drink driving wasn't really frowned upon. It is now. Racism happened a lot and everyone's saying oh this is the worst witness I don't know because I know that England fans used to racially abuse John Barnes okay mm -hmm. and bullet through posts and if you speak to you know when I used to speak to Cyril Reeses who was my agent God rest his soul you know the things that happened to him so let's not try and say this is the worst that happened we've made a lot of strides but in my opinion now there needs to be like a proper ban do you know what I mean a year or two ban and then if that happens for the teams, then they'll really, really be scared. Do you know what I mean? They've got to hit them where it properly hurts. And that's the problem. So, And everybody's got to stick together. So when there was the apartheid stuff, people wouldn't go and play sport in South Africa. Made people take different, you know, stand up and take note. And that's what they've got to do. We've got to hit them in the pocket, but ban them. And then the majority will sort it out with the minority. And... That is the big thing. So football hooliganism, things like that. Eventually, when England got banned from all European competition, it started to stamp it out because people, the majority took over then and went, no, we're not having this now. You're impacting us all. So I'm sure there's loads and loads of great Bulgarian people, but this has brought absolute shame on them. So let's really hit them hard. And even if they say, oh, well, other countries than this and that, well, let's make an example of them. Exactly. So I think England players, the staff, the manager, credit Gareth Southgate. He was fantastic. Harry Kane, Henderson. And that's what you'll hear as well. 
you play with loads of white plates. They're as, they're as hurt and embarrassed and disgraced as you are, you know. And uh, But it happens. It's something that England do prepare you for. But we need to clean up our own game and be strong with that. But I'd love, love, not a silly little slap on the wrist. This needs to be absolutely throw the book at them, then everybody else would be scared. Absolutely. And I think as, a, as you know, sort of working in the media as well, I think that people have a responsibility to, to make it clear that it is a, f- a minority, a few. Because it, it, in my opinion, if you, you know, go down the route, and I know people don't necessarily do this intentionally, but if you go down the route of saying Bulgarian football is a disgrace or whatever country it is we're talking about, you do cause... A, a, a sort of bad atmosphere and a sort of hatred that probably isn't warranted because ultimately it is a small number of people doing that. I think if you go to every country in the world, you will find idiots like that. So I think it's very important that we, you know, home in on those individuals that are doing it rather than labeling certain countries as racist. Um, you know, because, you know, I come from a Greek background and I've, I've been to games in Cyprus where there's been, I've seen racial abuse towards players. But I know that in the country it's not a a common thing for people to be racist so I guess it's important that we home in on those individuals and highlight those rather than create this culture where we're looking at countries and saying they're racist they're not they're racist they're not so I think that's really really important as well yeah for sure because you can't because the natural thing if you as you say if you label a whole group then it's 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 uh they become defensive but also as you say it's it's a and some of it's educational so it has to be, look, we're not saying you're bad people, but the, the minority that are doing this, we are not having their behaviour. And that behaviour is letting, it is going to let everybody down. So when you get a few England fans that want to go and fight, England, all, all England fans get tarnished with that, even though most of them travel and don't cause any trouble. But you don't hear about that side. Most footballers are really, really nice people. But you hear about the ones who go and do the silly stuff. No one wants to talk about the nice stuff. So, yeah, we have to make sure that... But education is massive. Education is huge. But there's still, unfortunately, I think some really good people are going to have to be affected about by it because then they will be the ones that promote change. Does that make sense? Yeah. If they can't go and watch their team. And that's why the, the captain for Bulgaria last night, one, he's embarrassed because he knows the whole world is watching and was ready for this. But also it's going to impact him because he, he might lose two years of his international career and not all have to play in the stadiums. And the biggest thing is we can all go and play football on the pitch to go and play in front of a full house. Not many people can enjoy that. And again, yeah. it's taken away. So the players are going to stand up and say stuff and everybody gets together. But that's why I was disappointed in the manager saying that he didn't hear anything. If he didn't hear anything, that's poor. And that's him being defensive. In my opinion, I think he has to, you know, like Gareth Southgate would, he said that our game's not perfect. And if that was England fans, Gareth Southgate would dig them out. Absolutely. Yeah. With, with, with that shadow of a doubt. So that's the side as well. Everybody's got to work together and then we can eradicate it. And look, there will always, be, unfortunately, probably in my life, there will always be racism, but look how much it's improved, even from when I start playing to finish in. So let's hope for, you know, my children or my grandchildren and everybody else that ultimately football is a fantastic fantastic uh i don't know is it vehicle or, or way of, of of breaking down barriers because sport is so inclusive and, and it's a global game so i think i think that's something we've really got to keep pushing absolutely and matt just one final question um I, i'm just conscious i've taken up too much of your time so just one final question um i wanted to ask you about the transition between being a player and then becoming a pundit because i think a lot of people look at it and they think you know oh it's easy you know you're talking about the game that you've played for for 20 odd years but you know there's new technology now um i think i i can't remember who i heard speaking about it yesterday um peter crouch i was at a peter crouch event yesterday and he was talking about um you know having to use the little machines in the studio and having to you know practice getting your points across in a in a clear and concise way sort of in a small amount of time what are some of the challenges you found going from being a player to a pundit? Yeah, one, you don't really get much training at first. You just sort of plonked in, plonked in front of a camera. So there's cameras everywhere and this and that. You've got talk back in your ear. So two or three people talking while you're talking is a bit weird. Um, but I think you just, the thing I've done is try and be myself. 
so and let my personality come across. Uh, offer a strong opinion, but not want to be personal. You can be a little bit worried sometimes. People you know, you don't want to offend them, but at the same time, you have to say what you see, but you don't need to be you say for really, really personal. But just try and say what you're seeing, explain why it's happening, because we've been out there. So if you're a goalkeeper and you experience it, of course, yes, you should save it, but why? And explain what it feels like, what it's like. Um, I have to watch a lot of football. I think that's what a lot of players find difficult when they realise, whoa, even though we're doing this game, the amount of other stuff, games that have gone on, you need to relate to. So you have to really keep on top of things. It's moving all the time. The technology side, I haven't done too much of the the touchscreen and that. But again, you if you want to be the best, people like Gary Neville and Jamie Carragher, they're always on them. You know what I mean? So then when they use it, they're bang on. And I think their analysis is fantastic. And you just got to be able to say what isn't really, really obvious. You know what I mean? Everyone Absolutely, can see certain yeah. bits, but offer that bit more in depth. But at the same time, it's got to be understood by everybody. So maybe people like ourselves who watch a lot of football and play and stuff like that might understand different terminology to other people who haven't played or been involved at that level, but you've still got to engage with everybody and kids and everything else. So that, that can be quite tough. And the radio side where your people's eyes, ears, everything, that's, that's even tougher. At least when you do TV, there's pictures there to show it. Yeah. Um, but look, it's a, it's a fantastic job. Of course you make mistakes, you say things, you offer your opinion. It's not, you know, it's your opinion. It's not often fact. Um, and then don't be too touchy when people disagree with you and come and hammer you on Twitter. So <laughs> Absolutely. things like that. But no, it's a great job. I love it. Absolutely love it. And uh, just wish I got to watch Wolves more. <laughs> absolutely great stuff. And you're absolutely right about the radio thing. I've done some radio commentaries and I found them quite difficult at times because like you said you, you you're not only talking about what's going on you're talking about where it is on the pitch yeah in relation it, there's so much that goes into that and i always think that if you can master radio commentary you'll be fine on tv so you know it's uh really interesting stuff and I, i'm learning along the way and it's great to hear uh some insight from someone like yourself who's who's done both played the game and now is a successful pundit Matt, thank you so, so much for taking the time out to talk to me. I cannot tell you how grateful I am. And uh, hopefully we can speak again in the future. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, I'd love to. And uh, you have to speak to some of my mates as well. We've all got their stories to tell. I'd I'd absolutely love to. Keep up the good work, man. Okay? Thank you. Cheers, mate. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye.